the first 20 grams of protein very clearly you have like a linear anabolic response then the next 20 so from 20 to 40 uh, you get a little bit of additional value but it's diminishing gains about 40 it seems to not really do that much um, but recently um, we kind of shoved that principle completely from the table um, because in my opinion, those studies kind of missed something. That's Professor Jorn Trommelin, researcher in protein metabolism at Maastricht University in the Netherlands. When you consume high doses of protein in a single meal, the thinking used to go that anything in excess of 40 grams of protein would just be burnt off or oxidized. As a result, the thinking would go that you would spread out your protein intake over multiple meals a day to make sure each meal had less than 40 grams of protein making each gram of protein be utilized more effectively for muscle growth. However, that changed recently. Just last year, Jorn and his colleagues published a study comparing ingesting 25 grams of milk protein to 100 grams of milk protein. Why 100 grams? Well, they determined that most people wouldn't really be able to have more than around 100 grams in a single sitting, just practically speaking. That is a lot of protein. They had participants perform a lifting session after which they ingested either 25 or 100 grams of protein. In contrast to previous studies, they looked at up to 12 hours after that protein ingestion. Specifically, where did the protein consumed go? How did it get metabolized and used up in various tissues across the body? There are four steps for your body to use protein that you're ingesting. First, there is ingestion. In the first step, your teeth are responsible for mechanical digestion. Specifically, they break down the food into smaller food particles to increase the surface area that enzymes are able to act on in the next few steps. The food will then enter your digestive tract, where it first enters the stomach. In the stomach, gastric glands are responsible for secreting hydrochloric acid. Hydrochloric acid unravels the protein bonds, making it easier for future digestive steps to access the peptide bonds. Likewise, the enzyme pepsin breaks down proteins into smaller peptide chains. Next, the food will enter your small intestine, where it finalizes the digestive process. At this point, free amino acids are absorbed through the wall of the small intestine and released into your blood circulation. And finally, in step four, the amino acids from protein are transported around the body for one of two uses, either being used by different tissues for protein synthesis, or being oxidized or burnt for energy. Many different tissues across your body can use amino acids for protein synthesis. In fact, not just your muscle. Your muscle has a pretty low protein turnover rate compared to other tissues, like hair, for example. However, protein can also be burnt or oxidized for energy. Here's how that happens. First, deamination needs to occur in the liver, which is the removal of the amino group. From here, this creates keto acid. Keto acid can then be used for a variety of things, including gluconeogenesis, which is creating glucose from protein. From here, keto acids can be used for a variety of purposes in energy metabolism, such as creating glucose from scratch, which is a process called gluconeogenesis. Keto acids can also be converted into ATP via the Krebs cycle or the citric acid cycle. However, protein isn't your body's preferred form of fuel. Carbohydrates and fats are much preferred. That's because there's many steps in the process of turning protein to energy. Now that you understand how protein traverses your body, we can better understand the results of your study. What happened? Did excessive protein really just get burnt off? Wouldn't 100 grams of protein just get wasted? Here's what they did. The night before participants came into the lab, they stopped eating at 10 p.m. At 7.45 in the morning, participants arrived in the lab. To examine protein metabolism, blood samples and muscle biopsies were taken throughout the day at various points. Participants first performed a lifting session with 60 minutes of full body training. Following this immediately, they consumed either 25 or 100 grams of milk protein. Notably, milk protein is fairly slow digesting. By using a new novel isotope tracer technology, the researchers were able to look at a longer time frame than previous studies, up to 12 hours after participants consumed protein. And here are the results. Four more amino acids reached into the circulation with 100 grams of protein versus 25. In fact, as you'd expect, around four times as many amino acids. So at the very least, proportionately the same amount of amino acids successfully made it through the digestive process and actually reached circulation, even with 100 grams of protein. Not much additional protein was actually oxidized when consuming 100 versus 25 grams of protein. All types of protein enrichment, meaning taking amino acids from the bloodstream and adding them to tissues, 
were substantially higher when consuming 100 grams of protein versus 25. But what about the protein use we actually care about, which is to say myofibrillar protein synthesis, adding new proteins into your myofibrils or muscle fibers? Well, in the zero to four hour time frame, the 100 gram condition had 20% higher protein synthesis rates compared to a 25 gram condition. In the four to 12 hour time frame, the 100 gram condition had 40% greater protein synthesis compared to a 25 gram condition. And in fact, that wasn't the only difference. Release of amino acids into the bloodstream or into the circulation hadn't even ended by the time the 12 hours were up when consuming 100 grams of protein. In contrast, when consuming only 25 grams, release into the circulation had effectively ended after around four hours. So no, even 100 grams of protein in a single sitting wasn't wasting protein. Even over 12 hours after ingesting 100 grams, protein was still being released into circulation. And likewise, substantially more protein was being used for increasing myofibrillar protein synthesis, aka muscle growth. Additionally, substantially more amino acids went towards increasing myofibrillar protein synthesis with 100 grams of protein compared to 25. But why did your study specifically have different findings than studies before it? Was it just a fluke or is there something else that can explain it? The studies that looked at that, they just gave a single meal and then they measured the anabolic response over a period of four to five hours, which is not crazy when you think about it because you have breakfast and then four or five hours you have your next meal, you have lunch and four or five hours you have your next meal, and then you have dinner and four or five hours later you go to bed. So kind of makes sense. But the simple reality is, is if you consume a large amount of protein, you simply need more time to digest it. So you can very easily test this out, have like uh, five hamburgers or steaks at a barbecue, uh, wake up in the middle of the night to pee, and you'll just feel you have a lot of meat still in your, in your gut. You're still digesting. Jorn also mentioned that previous studies didn't quite have the results that people thought they had. When you look at that data, you see like, oh yeah, with higher protein intakes, it seems like the amount of protein that you burn for energy or you oxidize, Yes, it goes up, but if you actually calculate that back to how many grams of protein am I burning, it's almost nothing. So if you say I go from 40 to 60 grams and I burn an additional two grams, I'm like, that leaves 18 grams of protein for anabolism. I'll take that deal. So having too much protein in a single meal really isn't an issue. Does that mean we can just throw protein distribution out the window altogether? So just for context, I was... Uh, originally more in the protein distribution uh, camp, so to speak. Um, I thought, okay, maybe there's not that much evidence from uh, long-term studies that uh, protein distribution has an uh, added benefit, but those studies are horrible to do. Like who wants to sign up and then be allocated? Please eat this pattern for 12 weeks. Time-restricted feeding, intermittent fasting became uh, more and more popular. There was more research on that. And from a protein distribution point of view, it's the hor most horrible thing you can do. They intentionally try to fast as many hours in, in the day. So it's the worst protein distribution. Um, but then meta-analysis on intermittent fasting showed that it doesn't really, it's not really detrimental for, um, for muscle mass as long as it's uh, nitrogen matched with the other conditions, of course. Protein timing just doesn't seem to matter all that much. There are studies in intermittent fasting, having more or fewer meals per day, all generally finding pretty similar increases in lean body mass in the long run, but also following a lifting routine. But do we have any better recommendations? What's my recommendation? For athletes, I would still say I would aim for four meals a day because that's extremely simple. That is like breakfast, lunch, dinner, just a uh, the most socially desired meal, uh, meal pattern, then take an extra meal prior to sleep. That is like if you add an extra meal, which point of the day will best increase your distribution? It will be prior to sleep. Do I think all of that will make much difference? No, but it's so easy. Just do it and you don't have to worry about it anymore. This four meal approach recommended by Jorn can also be a great way to make sure you're getting enough total protein in. If you enjoyed the video, Please make sure you like the video, subscribe, and comment. If you like this video, you'll probably like our newsletter. Go to strongbiscience.com slash newsletter to receive free bi-weekly research breakdowns. Likewise, if you're looking for a coach, our team of coaches has you covered. Go to strongbiscience.com slash coaching to start your training and nutrition with an expert coach 
today. Jorn, you absolutely killed it. You put out some of the most interesting research consistently. Where can people find you, your lab, your research, everything? On most social media, I, uh, I post under Nutrition Tactics. Don't worry, there's an occasional exercise study in there as well. So Nutrition Tactics on most platforms, and from there you can, uh, you can find most of my uh, stuff. Strong by Science, Dr. Mike Wolf. Until next time.